we have music playing all the time now. I think it's kind of cool. A little piano music. It's kind of neat. Anyway, are you ready? Yep. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's pray. So, Father, thank you for this day, for this opportunity that we have. Uh, we just are grateful and thankful to you to gather us together. Thank you for calming our hearts, stilling our minds, and just giving us reflection and opportunities to see you and your hand and what you're doing and have done and are continuing to do in our lives. Just particularly thank you for uh, getting Grant through his situation this week, bringing him back to some stability there and continue to be at the heart of uh, Coletta and the family there. And thank you so much for continuing to work and find resolution and permanent healing to this uh, ongoing intestinal stomach issues that he has with regards to the diet restrictions and so forth. So, Father, we just thank you for all that you continue to do and bless each and every one throughout your congregation, your ministry. It, it, is, it is your flock. You are the shepherd. We are your sheep. So we ask that you would uh, continue to find us faithful to submit to you and look to you and be subjected to you as you are. Be with each and every one, Father, continue to encourage and equip and uh, help us to see what you want us to see, to do it differently, understanding who we are and so we can live differently and what we need to do in the challenges and opportunities of life that you put us through, these tests and trials and opportunities for growth. So we thank you for what you've shown us in your word. Continue to guide and direct us as we look now into other things in your word for answers to questions and bless each and every one of your children, your sons, your daughters, like we are all your people. Be with us now as our counselor, our teacher, our pastor, our guide, our savior, our shepherd, everything that you are to us, our father, creator. In Jesus, Yeshua's name, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so as I am trying to get used to turning to the right, instead of turning to the left, you may, you may think that it's kind of like, it, it makes you have a whole new appreciation for people who do runway modeling and they go, I can't turn the other way. It kind of, I, I get it now. It really messes with your head when you're used to turning one way and then you gotta, it may seem like a simple thing to some people, but it is kind of different, it is different. I'll tell you that right now. I don't know how it is for you viewing it, but it's for us doing it, for babes doing the camera for me up front. It's just everything is reversed. As I'm in the, um, anyway, no big deal. We're brain will adapt. So as we go through the Q&A for uh, this session, we're gonna do in the August Q&A. Uh, got a couple of questions in regards um, to some things to, to look at. Um, there wasn't, you know, some <coughs> tons of questions, but we had two from Laney, and one from Pam, and we had actually two from Dodd, actually. I'll put another one here on, on uh, uh, so it's a detail. Just kind of inform it, you wanted to um, detail a firmament drawing. So the question that we have is Laney wanted to know about locust and Joel versus Revelation, um, Numbers 15, 27, uh, and then Pam asked about Genesis 11, Todd, Matthew 13, and then the last question was about the, de the detail of the firmament, kind of going from a graph that you see online very dominantly of the old Hebrew view of how they saw that versus what we see in Genesis, knowing what we know today. So first things first, uh, if there's any other questions that you wanted to add, uh, please do that. If there is questions that I missed, and God knows that I, I, I've done this, and it's been a very full week, obviously, for uh, different reasons for, for us, for me. Uh, a lot of change, a lot of things just kind of swirling constantly. In two weeks, we're going to see each other, of course, and coming up on the big day, the big wedding day. So that's around the corner. Be here before you know it. So in lieu of all that, so... Uh, <coughs> we'll be continuing to look at this Q&A, but again, if other things do come up that I did miss or have additional questions too, uh, please, as typical fashion, just let me know, all right? All right, so first things first, Laney asked about the locust in Joel and Revelation. There was not a specific uh, question there other than Laney just asked me if I ever did a study on it before, have I compared the locust in Joel to locust in Revelation? Uh, and the answer is I have not done that uh, in the past. I've not done a study on that. But what she's referring to, uh, for context, to read in Joel chapter 1, he says in <coughs> chapter 1, and it's just for verses uh, 1 through 4, he says, And the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pithuel, hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. This is Joel 1, verse 2. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers, Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell your children that that which the palmer worm 
hath left hath the locust eaten, eaten, and that which the locust have left the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm have left the caterpillar has eaten. Then you go uh, further down, and he's basically talking about in, in context here, and he says in verse 13, gird yourselves and lament, and you priests, how you ministers of the altar, uh, come all ye, all, come lie at night, sackcloth, you ministers of my, to, you ministers of my God, Elohim, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God, Elohim. Sanctify you a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord, alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. It is, is not for the meat cut off before our eyes, and so so he goes into a, a great um, context here, which in Joel is a reference, obviously, to that time going into the day of the Lord, meaning he's going to come back in the Armageddon process of that and lay waste. There's a lot of desolation, as we know, uh, that happens toward the end. You've got the Gog and Magog battle number two that happens at the end of the tribulation period, being there's people don't, you know, you're hearing me say this for the first time, you may go, what did you just say? So Gog and Magog is typically taught as one battle amongst these people want to put it into so fancifully into Russia and China and things like this. But in actuality, get, get your mind off the countries for a second and just think about the fact that behind it, re irrelevant to the countries, what's really relevant is that Satan is behind it using the 10 Muslim kings that he's putting over different provinces of the world, the new geographic landscape of his dominion and tribulation. When he comes, when he comes the beast, He's going to reallocate whatever he deems fit because there's a collapse of the ecumenical uh, mystery Babylon is two, twofold, it's a religious and economic, and he's going to uh, destroy all of that. And then you have the mark of the beast comes into play, the second half. So the second half is when you have this de demarcation of different countries becoming no more. It's irrelevant. So the relevance of, of trying to act like, well, it's Russia, it's China. That's just the land from which you can reference, but don't get caught up in the country itself. Uh, get, get caught up in the fact that it's a very grievous and demonstratively wicked time in which Satan and the Antichrist, who then is murdered and then risen again three days later as the beast, will then put up his image and it will start to speak and he demands worship. It's pretty bad. He chases the Jews and so forth into Petra and then comes after the rest of the people on the planet that are still living, that are seeing Christ as, because you have a lot of people still in Christ that are here, people don't realize that. There's a lot going on. Well, toward the end of this, as you have God's wrath continuing to heat up, you have a lot of desolation. In Revelation, uh, he mentions, in lieu of Revelation chapter 9, Laney was asking about Revelation chapter 9, and Revelation 9, he says, let's go there, Revelation 9, and he talked about, and, a, and the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and he saw a star having fallen from the heaven to the earth, and there was given to him the key of the pit of the abyss. And he opened the pit of the abyss, and the smoke ascended out of the pit, and as the smoke of the great furnace, this is Revelation 9, verses 1, now verse 2, as the smoke of the great furnace and the sun of the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit, and from the smoke went out locusts on the earth, and there was given them power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was said then they should not injure the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree. And men should not have their seal of God on their forehead. So the reality is the, the ones with the seal on their forehead, he's talking about they can't injure the soon Medicos people. So the locusts take place in the second half of the tribulation period. The people in Joel were mentioning, if you notice closely, canker worms, locusts, and caterpillars. That goes back to Exodus. I'll get your question in a second. When they saw the locust coming forth, there was the flying locust. Then there's like the eating, there's like ones that don't fly, that they call them locusts, but they're more like the ones that we would call grasshoppers today. They go across the, the ground. Then there's the caterpillar, the wolf canker worm, he calls it. So there's three different types of these, these critters that are darkening the ground and darkening the sky and come in with in the Exodus days of the plagues. That's what you saw. And then you see this happening again as a type of a plague or a type of judgment of God unto the, the earth. Yes? Uh, Tracy said, is there a way to turn up the volume? Todd said, our volume is loud. And Tracy said, mine is not a bit muffled. The mic is too low. And Greg and Sandy and Marilyn said, ours is good. Vicki uh, said, Tracy's probably on a laptop, not a desktop. The speakers are not as good in the laptops. I have a similar problem. 
Okay, so if it's, if it's, yeah, so if everybody else is hearing okay, then I'm sorry, Tracy, it, may, it must mean that your end of the resource there is just a difficulty at this time. I do apologize for that. I don't, I don't know how to fix that. Um, if everybody else is hearing good, then it's just on your end. Possibly, I don't know, maybe even sometimes a hard connection may help as well if you're using the same resource. So maybe a desktop, if that's not attainable, then maybe just hardwire instead of Wi-Fi. Maybe, I don't know. I'm just guessing here. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm not the tech guy. So um, again, sorry about that. Uh, so I'll move this up. Vicki said use your earbuds. There you go, use the earbuds. That, okay, all right. So in, in lieu of the uh, question that Lainey's asking is, are locusts comparable? The answer is yes, they are comparable because they both show up during the time of the, of the last three and a half years of tribulation from which you have a, a most terrible wrath, which is called Jacob's trouble. So if you were to put this on, on the board, they're both, so they're both related to Jacob's trouble which is last half of tribulation. And again, we have Revelation, um, who was that? Sorry. <laughs> Nine, verses one to four. So you have Revelation 9, one to four, and you have Joel one to five there, I think it was, that we looked at earlier, is that right? I think it was Joel 1 to 5, or 4, excuse me. 1 to 4 also. 1 through 4. So those locusts have reference to the desolation of the earth. And what are they, what are they depicting? The first time God used locusts in the scripture, you see that in the book of Exodus and the plagues in Egypt where he covered the sky and they covered the ground. And it's interesting that later on, every time I think of the locust, I don't know what it is about my brain, but I think about how in Persia and history, they would say that the Persians, that their army, when they were the, remember they got, you got the Babylonian, the Medes and Persians was the chest, then the Greeks and the Romans. Well, the second greatest kingdom, according to God's image he gave to Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel interpreted, that you have there, the Medes and Persians kingdom, uh, when, that, when the Persians were in that realm of being the ones who ruled the world, in essence, you had a issue there where they actually had their spears, not spears, their arrows, would they would say they lift up their arrows and they would just shoot them simultaneously. And it was a euphemism, it's not literal, but was, they said there, there were so many arrows, they would black out the sun. And that's a thing they've used in many movies and many different platitudes, but that's based upon an historical record. That's how these people saw the fear of the Persian army because not only did, were they many and they, they fought pretty how you want to say, uh, more barbaric-like, you had the fact that you had to even live to get hand-to-hand -hand combat because all these people that would throw their, archers would throw their arrows in the air at you, I mean, shoot them in the air at you. It's just crazy, insane. That's a lot of arrows. There's that many arrows that could, that could hyperbole get that image of blotting out the sun. That's a lot of arrows. So in lieu of all of that, we do see that it's, it's quite a bit of, of difference there um, in the locusts, and, and you see that in Joel, he's talking about desolating the land rather than revelation, they're coming after the, this description of causing harm unto man. And so it's rather interesting. Locust and Joel is about the destruction of the land, whereas Joel and Revelation is about destruction of the people. So, so again, in, in, in Joel, it's about the land, whereas in Revelation, it's about the people. But they both Destruction, because you have, as it says in Joel, what, how does he say it? The day of the Lord is at hand. So you have the day of the Lord. At hand. And that's, whoops, I'll put it here. That's Joel 1, and that's, I just read that from verse 15. Boy, is it weird looking to my left. See, I'm, I'm all over with this. I can, I can be ambidextrous. I don't know. So in any event, uh, I hope that, um, is Lainey online, babe? No. Okay. No. She's probably with her folks right now. That's okay. So hopefully Lainey can hear that. And just it wasn't a really a depth question of a detail-specific issue. She wanted to know, generally speaking, is there, related, is there a relation? The answer is yes. Uh, have I taught about it? No. 
Uh, what is that relation? They speak to destruction. It's, it's a reference to the first time locust is used in, in Exodus as a type of destruction, the plagues. Uh, in that sense, it was of the land. Joel then repeats that as a future imagery of also, again, they're going to destroy the land as they did in, in Exodus, which would mean that you're going to have a darkness that's going to cover the earth that he's talking about, which is spiritual and literal in that sense. That's pretty scary to think about that. And so you always see darkness. Remember, we talked about already, we're going to get to that in the last question about when we saw in Genesis that God did not make the darkness. It, the world became darkness because of what Satan had done and ruining what God had created. And so you have this aspect of darkness setting in as a result of or as the consequence of or as the accompanying of evil running, around, running amok, wickedness running wild, unchecked, unchallenged. So it doesn't surprise us that locusts will then end the plagues, typify darkness and blackness over the earth, and I'll show you that, just as they will here. So if you go over, let me just give you a reference back to um, in Exodus, when he was speaking about the plagues in Egypt. So if you go back into... Um, the plagues in Egypt. Well, hold on a minute. I'm going to go back. I just lost my spot. So if you go back into uh, Exodus in chapter 10, you will see how this issue of the locust is in verse chapter 10, verse 4. And he said, uh, when he said, that let, the peop let people go is what, oh, excuse me. Uh, verse 3, Moses and Aaron, this is chapter 10 of Exodus, verse 3, Moses and Aaron said unto, the, unto, Mos uh, to Pharaoh, uh, the, so, thus saith the Lord of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me, lest my people go, that they may serve me? And else, and he says, because if they refuse to let, let people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your coast. Now watch what the Lord says. He says, and they will cover the face of the earth, and, the, and that no one can be able to see the earth. And they shall eat the residue of which is escaped, which remains unto you from the hail. They shall eat every tree which grows at you, at you, for you out of the field, and they will fill thy houses and the houses of your servants and the houses of the Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy father's fathers have seen since the day they were upon the earth unto this day. And he turned, him, he turned himself and went from Pharaoh. So you see that God's making it very clear they were going to cover the earth. So many of them, you wouldn't be able to see the earth. They're going to black out, in other words, the grass. You won't be able to see any green. They're going to see a bunch of locusts. Whatever color those locusts were. So you have that same imagery of them blotting out the, the earth. You're going to have this desolation over in Joel describing locusts. So you're talking about a lot of carnage to vegetation. You're talking fruits, veggies, trees, getting just laid waste by these locusts in the tribulation period. So Joel gives more of an imagery, a kind of similitude to the Exodus plagues of the locusts, which then Revelation adds some more teeth to the bones and says, oh, by the way, you think that's bad. That vegetation is laid waste, and the food shortage is going to be ridiculous, right? Well, don't be so much of a concern for a food shortage when you have a population that's being wiped out by the masses by just the sheer nature of this wrath of God being unveiled. So there is a correlation of two different sides of that coin of darkness, consequences of, of sin running amok, how Satan is now in the beast, dominating the world scale under Jacob's trouble of God's prophetic calendar of the Daniel 70th week. And then it's coming to this end of the day of the Lord coming at hand. So I hope that answers the question for Laney. But again, is there a relation to that, Joel, in Revelation? Yes. Did I teach on it before? No. And what's it speak to? Desolation, judgment. One of the land, Joel, which is type of Egypt. And then one revelation of the people themselves. But again, Revelation mentions also that the Semitical or the ones with the seal of God on their foreheads are protected. So then you go to Numbers 15, 27. I would say, Laney, is that satisfactory? But you're not online to say yes or no. Hopefully, if I would ask that, <laughs> rhetorically speaking, you would you would say yes. So in Numbers 15, verse 27, uh, Laney asked the other question. So she asked about the sin of, of ignorance, or has it's written in some translations of unintentional sin. So in Numbers 15, you go to verse 27, and it says, and if any and if anyone's soul sin through ignorance or inadvertently. Right, depending on your translation of the word it would use, but it is a similar meaning. So, again, unintentionally, ignorantly, um, inadvertently, he shall bring a she goat of the first year for a sin offering. 
And the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly or inadvertently or, or uh, um, unintentionally. And before the Lord God, the face of Kave, and he shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. All right, and it says, You shall have one law for him that sins through ignorance, but both for him that is born among the sons of Israel and for the stranger that surgeon among them. So, Lanny asked the question, What is exactly the sin of ignorance? Is there a specific definition? Can we clarify this? What does this really mean? Um, I'll put on here inadvertently, as it says in some inadvertent. So what is the sin of ignorance, unintentional, or inadvertence? It, it's simple. It, it's called being you. Um, as long as you're a finite human creation, you're going to have sins of ignorance. It's just that simple. For those who think, oh, I never had a sin of ignorance, don't say that because the fact that you say that makes you completely ignorant. If you knew everything, then you'd be God. And since you're not God, you don't know everything. Since you don't know everything, if that includes every human who ever has lived, every human who has lived and ever will live except for Christ himself who lived in human flesh. No one else except for Christ himself can say, I know everything. So stop with your, you know, that's, that's ignorant to think that. Or I've attained a certain level of enough knowledge to, it's just craziness. So the reality is that you have people that have, mistaken this ignorance or inadvertentness or uh, what's the other word, sorry, <laughs> unintentionalness to get into a specific, a specific sin, but in fact it's more of a blanket issue to say, look, it's just called the sin of being human because you're going to do things that you don't know you're not supposed to do. You're going to do things that you didn't mean to do, but you did it because you were just not thinking. It wasn't intentional. Um, and so there, you're going to do things inadvertently, like he's, he mentioned, it's about how you're un unintentional, ignorantly, inadvertently. There's things that you do because you're just a finite, frail, limited human. And you say, what's an example of a sin of ignorance, inadvertence, or unintentionalness? It's easy. You, say, you speak the truth, but you, you offend a brother or a sister in Christ. Who's ever done that? <laughs> I, I have. You tell me you haven't? Stop lying. Yeah, you have. We all have. But it, it, that, that wasn't, you didn't mean to sin. You spoke the truth, but you offended somebody when you did it. Ooh, yay, yay, yay. You know, and Paul says, hey, you know, yeah, you may not eat the food sacrificed to idols, but other people do. Some folks have no problem with it. Just because you do and you, they don't, don't make a beef out of that and cause someone to be a stumbling block. He calls it the weaker, stronger brother argument, which is a similar process of thought around if you don't understand the different levels of people's spiritual condition or in their mental capacity, maturity, intellectual capacity of this life, you could easily offend them. You could easily be causing a sin of ignorance or inadvertentness or unintentionalness of causing an offense to somebody. Or, dare I say, better yet, you could be sinning against God himself. Because when you don't know any better and you think, this is okay to do this, these actions are okay. And you say, why do you think that? Because mom and dad told me. Because the person in charge in the pulpit told me. Because books I see about Jesus tell me. Because, that I, well, wait a second, time out. Th those aren't right. Those are wrong. That, that's not right. And they go, well, I didn't, I didn't know all my life. I, I was told that was okay. Well, that, that's not true. You, you say, give me an example. Well, example would be someone might say, well, I was taught my whole life that this, this particular, be I'm not going to name call people out, but you say this certain behavior is okay. Or you say things like, well, women, for example, has been known for Christianity's history. They pick on women a lot. And they say, well, women can't wear makeup. Women can't wear anything but a dress. And that's not in the scripture per se, everything in there like that. <laughs> There's some different things about being modest and having your beauty and glory be that of God and not of your physical flesh. I get that. Yes, that's true. But for a woman to put makeup on or to dress up, nothing's wrong with that. And taking pride and taking some uh, you know, love and appearance of how God's made you. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and us men, we sure do like that, right? So the reality is that you can't sit here and, sit and say to me that because, well, I was raised a woman can't have makeup, and then all of a sudden you see a woman with a makeup, and you get in a big, you know. It's, there's all these kind of things that people do that sin against each other, but there's more, I think, people don't realize that they sin against God. They don't realize it. They don't realize it. They'll, they'll take, you say, how do you sin against God in ignorance? Taking Scripture out of context constantly. It's irritating to God. I can only imagine. I mean, he's not irritated. I shouldn't say that. It's irritating to me 
So I can imagine how it just maybe just makes God go, <laughs> that's kind of funny. The people keep getting the scripture wrong. You know, the most famous one. Where two or three are gathered in, in, in the midst, it, to, together he's in their midst. So when there's just one of us, he's not here? Come on, man. So if I'm stranded, darn, God's not with me. Really? How ignorant is that? So when it was just the man in the garden before Eve came around, God's like, yon yo, come on. Don't, it's just so ignorant to think that way, you know? It's just not smart. But people think that way, and they keep saying that. So stop saying it. But we keep saying it. Or they say things like, I'm going to uh, do this and this and this to further God's kingdom. Well, that's a sin of ignorance because you're associating God's kingdom to something that you have something to do with. You have nothing to do with God's kingdom. Nothing. You can't further nothing. That you have. It's not your kingdom. You're not the king. So tell me again, how can you further it? I I'm confused. Explain to me. How can I further something I'm, I'm not the ruler of? How can I further that which isn't even here yet? You say, oh, that's not true because my pastor said that, that God's kingdom's in your heart. And when you tell people about Jesus, then they become a believer in Jesus. I just further God's kingdom spiritually. Well, wait a second. Time out. Forget what your pastor says and forget what I say. Just forget it. What did Jesus say? You might have heard of him. He's like the guy who runs all of us. He's like the head. He's the CEO. He runs the business, right? He's the owner of this Christianity. It's named after him. He said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I, excuse me? Thy kingdom come from heaven to earth. He made it crystal clear that he's the king. Later on in the scripture, he says the kingdom would be here. The king is in your midst. So he's talking about he's the king. We know that to be a fact. And the kingdom, he said to Pontius Pilate, if my kingdom were of this world, my soldiers would fight for me. So don't give me this malarkey about what you think. I don't care what you think. What did Jesus say? What did Yeshua say? He told you what the truth is. If you don't want to hear it, that's fine. But don't continue to say things that are ignorant, inadvertent, and unintentional that are, in essence, offense against God because it, it, it suits you well to fit the majority. Stop saying it. Stop it. It's not correct. It's not accurate. It's unbiblical. So a sin of ignorance, inadvertence, or unintentionalness is sometimes offending against God himself because you take him out of context or his word, or you offend other people. One last example I'll give you about this. I don't know if you realize this, but when it says the famous commandment of all people misquote off out of context is the, you shall not take the Lord God's name in vain. People constantly associate that with cussing, saying that GD or Jesus' name in a, in a vain way. That has nothing to do with taking God's name in vain. It's part of the definition and through application. But you know what that means? It means do not associate God's name with a vain, void, empty, hollow statement of ignorance. In other words, don't say, God said if I was going to go down this road, an angel would be before me and behind me and beside me. He didn't say that. Stop lying. He didn't say that. You're just saying that because you're going to go down a road where God's trying to kill you, and you're going to give him a reason to be an idiot but you're not being safe and secure, and you're going to go, well, God's supposed to protect me. He didn't, oh my gosh. Stop testing the Lord thy God. Not even God the Son took that length of that ignorance. Are you serious right now? People will do things constantly to say, well, well, God said, no, he didn't say. So stop it. Stop it. He didn't say these. these God said, if I played the lottery, I would win. Where's that? Where's that chapter and verse at? In the book of I want, chapter 1, verse 2, under ignorance? Really? Come on, man. So, People constantly will take God's name in vain, which is what he means. Don't associate to me that which I never said. You know, people associate the story, by the way. How many people? I, I guarantee you, if you ask people in Christianity, um, don't, by the way, do a little survey. Test this out. It, it's hysterical. You'll laugh, but it's true. Ask them these two questions. The most oft taken out of context, God's name in vain. They'll say the golden rules in the Bible. Is it? Do unto others as they do unto you. They think that, that's a verse in the Bible. No, it's not. But they think it is. That's an idea in the Bible, but there's not a verse that says that. They think it is. Ask them. Go ahead, ask them. They'll go, yeah, I don't know. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. Then they'll say, then you ask them, oh, what about that story where the, there was a story of the guy on, on, top, of a, on top of a roof 
and, and, and he was flooding, and, and he said, God, please help me, save me. And God sent people on a boat, and he goes, oh, God, please help me, save me. And God sent folks and, and a helicopter and so on and so on. And people think that that story's in the Bible. No, it ain't. It's a made-up story. People think that Mary Magdalene is the one caught in adultery. No, she's not. No, she's not. She's the one with seven demons that God freed from her. Jesus said, oh, and demons left her. And that's why she loved Jesus so much. She wasn't some harlot sleeping around town. Stop degradating the woman's legacy and her, and her historical record has something to do with adultery. She was a woman with demonic seven demons in her. And Jesus said, oh, and she was like, yeah, yes. And she followed him from that point on. So would you, if you were tormented by seven demons, and then you're made free again. Well, goodness gracious, I love that guy. No wonder she followed him so closely. She appreciated the depth of her despair being brought to a place of hope and restoration so gravely, just starkly different. That's why she was so blessed, because she took it with a deep sense of gratitude and thankfulness. And what do we do in Christianity? We bastardize her and say, she's an adulteress. She was the one Jesus was saying, no, no. No, she wasn't. There's a whole movie about it. The last temptation of Christ, they call it. It should be called the last idiocy of man because it's such an ignorant storyline. It's an ignorant premise, an ignorant storyline, ignorant issues. None of it's true. So again, I digress. But I hope that answers the question, what sense of ignorance is? Threefold. Taking God's word out of context. Taking God himself out of context. And misapplying things ignorantly. And then also doing things ignorantly that offend your brother. So you offend your brother, you offend your Lord, your God, or you actually take scripture itself out of context. And you do it ignorantly, unintentionally, inadvertently. The good news is, it's okay. It's okay if you've done that. You know what? There's room at the cross for all of us. There's room in being sanctified and being reconciled and being made clean again. Just ask God to forgive you, confess and repent, agree to God that's wrong, and turn around and make it right. That's it. So it doesn't matter if you've done it in the past. Did it yesterday. It's okay. Stop doing it. Confess, admit you're wrong, agree with God, repent, turn away from it, turn to God, and then sin no more. That's the pattern. You do that, you're good. Don't worry about it. It's over. Don't worry about it. No big deal. Don't worry about it. So that's sin of ignorance, okay? So I'll put on the board here, again, to either you, you offend God, you offend, his, you offend the word of God, Or you offend others. And it's all because you're human. And by the way, I'm human. I don't know about if you are. Are you human? I think I can. So we're all human. So I will always be in a state where I'm thanking God for the sin of ignorance thing. Because I thank God he gives us a sin offering for that in Christ. He, he encompasses no longer in the Old Testament. It was parsed out. But since we have Christ, he's the fulfillment of all of that, right? So thank God we got him for all of that. So Jesus just said, just come to me, and I, I'm, I represent every sacrifice for every sin, including the ignorant, unintentional, inadvertence that you're going to have done, are doing, and will still do in the future, just so you know, no matter how much you know, you're still going to get involved, and at points where you offend God unintentionally, where I offend God, where I offend the word of God, where I offend others, it's going to happen. I, I, I can't get around that. It's going to happen. I don't want to do that. But it's going to happen. You're going to do that. I'm going to do that. The, the thought is that you've got to minimize that and recognize when it does happen, it's just called being human, and God's got your back on that and says, <laughs> son, daughter, I got this. I've already, already told you that's going to happen. That's who you are. You're frail. You're finite. You're weak. You'll stumble. But get up. Just get up. It's good. I got you. I clean you off. I forgive you. Let's embrace. Let's go on. That's all it is, okay? So I hope that answers Lenny's question on that one. Then you got Genesis 11:30, uh, and then your question there, Pam, is who's the them? So again, I would have asked Lainey at this point if she was here, is that answer satisfactorily? And hopefully, rhetorically, you would have said yes, Lainey, if you're hearing this on a replay. So in Genesis 11:30, the the question you said there is who is the them? And you're referring to when he says in verse 30 and 31, or verse 31 of Genesis 11, and Terah, which is Abram, took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with him from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. 
So, and the question you're having there is that part where it says, and they went forth with them. So the they is Terah, his wife, um, Lot, and you got Aver and his wife, right? So who's the them? Well, it's actually the answer, you're gonna, call it, you're gonna laugh at yourself, because it's actually right in front of your face, the verses before it. And it's, it's Nahor, that's who it is. It's Abraham's brother. Because he's describing, at this point, the father with Abram, who's the key figure, but before that he mentioned Nahor and his wife. So look in verse 29, 28 and 29. And at 28, and Haran died in the face of his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldean, Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. And Abraham's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and the father of Ishka. But Sarai was sterile. So the they, the them, who they're going with is Nahor and his wife. That, that's who went with, just so you know. So that answers your question. But then your other question is, what was Terah doing traveling, traveling that direction when it was Abram that was called out to go to the land of the Chaldeans? So again, the them is, is Nahor. And what? That's the them. So, why did, so the other question you ask is, what is Terah doing traveling out when it was Abram that was called? But that's not until the next chapter opening up in Genesis chapter 12 when God says, Abram, give him out your kindred, because Terah had just died at the end of chapter 11. So chapter 11, Terah dies. Chapter 12, Abraham's, Abram is called. Your question is, why was Terah leaving Ur to begin with, right? Now, we don't know for certain what that was about, uh, other than I can tell you that there is some backdrop to that, that people would say that um, there is extra biblical truth, uh, excuse me, extra biblical historical record, I don't know if it's true or not, that Abram was a, uh, a young man that was very forward in his belief. And there was a place, they were staying in the area of the Chaldees, where he would not want to worship these false gods, the particular ones that they wanted to do. He took issue with it, he made a scene. It made things bad for Terah and the family to live in such a town where his son was not compliant with the polytheistic ways of the town because of a certain god he didn't see eye to eye with. And so because he made a ruckus, daddy had to take the family and leave for better safety and better peace for the whole family. So that's the extra biblical version of why people say Terah was leaving, was they say, the, again, I want to be careful to say that, the extra biblical, okay? That's not written in Genesis 11, that just happened, okay? I'm telling you, that's what you would, would feed into, because if, you if you're reading back Genesis 11, go back there, back in Genesis chapter 11, as you're reading, it's really just telling you from the first time you see Terah come on the scene, verse 26, and it talks about how Terah just begat this, begat that, and then all of a sudden he heads out, and then there's no reason that tells you why he is heading out, right? So all you see is Genesis 11, verses 26, Terah is mentioned, through verse 32, and he dies. And in those seven verses, he mentions his kids and his kinfolk, and then he's leaving, and then he dies. So you're like, okay, to your point, well, why? And so the extra biblical uh, record speaks to the fact that that's some of the narrative as to what they think that was because of. So either way, whether that was true or not, it wasn't something that he was seeking God. There's no record biblically or extra biblically that speaks to Tara being a monotheistic person. He was polytheistic, just like his son Abram was. So his whole family was polytheistic, as most of them were during this time, especially in that, in that area. So that's what God was doing, was separating Abram to your point as a man, he would then begin his monotheistic understanding of who he is as the creator, because they had lost their way, obviously, right? So this is the idea behind what happened here in Genesis 11. You okay back there, babe? Yeah, I'm just. I heard, heard a heard noise. Okay, no, I heard a noise, okay. So when you're looking at the answer to that question, hopefully, um, I'm going to put on here, why did Tara uh, leave? So I'll put potentially due to family, family safety change of scenery due to Ah, whoops, I need to spell. 
due to um, Abram's lack of follow through or you know. disagreement. So it's almost like you have a, you know, a son making a big scene in town and obviously the dad's going to be accountable to this and he figures the whole town's going to come against him and this is the extra biblical record and therefore it's a lot easier to just take your family and leave for the safety and security of your family than it is to try to fight the masses of the mob, you know, and you have your son making a scene about a polytheistic God, small g, that they're trying to say is legit and he's going, no it's not. So, but he's still polytheistic. It was just a certain one he didn't like. <laughs> so that's what the extra biblical record says. Now, I don't know if that answers your question, but Sister Pam, has I answered your question satisfactorily? You, you tell me. Because then we got two questions left, believe it or not. We're not, we're going pretty quickly tonight, even with my long-winded self. Is they still there? Yeah. He said yes, I'm good. Okay, cool. So then you got Todd's question in Matthew 13, verse 36 to 43, and he says, what day are we in? And paraphrase, what's with the lake of fire thing? I thought that was just for the uh, Satan and his, and, his, and his emissaries, his angels. So what's up with that? So let's go read what you're talking about, what you're referencing is Matthew 13. So in Matthew 13, In verse 36, he says, Then Jesus, leaving the people, retired into the house, and his disciples approaching him said, Explain to us the parable of the darno in the field. So I'll tell you right now, we're in day seven, uh, and it's going to be encompassing the day seven at the beginning through the end, because he talks about the end of the age, and then the harvest happens. And then we're going to get into the second part of your question regarding well, what's with the lake of fire thing, and with who's involved there, and I'll get to that as well. So in verse 38, he says, the field is the world, the, the good seed are the sons of the kingdom, the darnel are the sons of the evil, or paneros, uh, the paneros one. And we're talking about uh, different aspects of people being the duality of the kingdom of, you have people in the heavens, you have people on the earth, and you have the darnel, which are the half-breeds of Jew and Gentile that have gotten married into, Gentiles married into some Jewish people during the transition from tribulation to the millennial kingdom. And the Darnell are the offshoot or the hybrid offspring of this Jew and Gentile hybrid. They tried to marry into the 144,000 Jews to proliferate an op opportunity to inherit because they thought they could do it by their own strength. Nothing's changed. Mankind has always been ig nor rent when it comes to doing things God's way. They figured they got their own way to do it. When it came to the garden, it was rationality. When it came to later on after the, uh, the, the flood, you have the Babel issue. It's like people are constantly ignorant. We as human beings want to rationalize how we can approach God, Garden of Eden. We want to, with our own strength, reach God, Babel, uh, collectively. You know? We want to, in, in this sense, we want to take it by force you know, in, in the Darnell. They did that before with Gog and Magog. They're going to do it again at the end of... Day seven, coming against the camp of the saints. Mankind is, is a thick-skulled, thick-headed, ignoramus being that actually thinks he can rationalize, uh, use the might together, uh, we can usurp God. I, I don't know why we think that, but it is completely ignorant. And I don't think that, but as we as a species think that, and it's just ignorant to me. But we think that, and we've done that for years. Thousands of years we've been doing this, and we still to this day think that we can be God, we can create like God does out of nothing, which is totally hilarious to me. So you have to have something, these so-called geniuses in science today, and they don't want to acknowledge the fact that God used nothing, absolutely nothing, and made everything. But they don't want to talk about that. So, so it all ebbed and flowed out of his energy source of himself, and he made everything. You know, it's not He didn't use something. He just used his own energy, his own self, which is like insane. So, so anyway, in any event, so we're in, in verse 39, he says, the enemy who sowed them is the adversary. Uh, that's, uh, again, you see Diabolos. And it, yes? And Todd said, there is no difference between Jew and Greek in Christ, especially after day six. Okay, again, okay. We're not, okay. We're talking about the 144,000 Jews 
that survived in Petra. They are not in Christ. Watch my face. They're not in Christ. They're not in Christ, okay? You can't, they're not in Christ. That's why they're in Petra. 144,000 Jews. They're there. They don't believe in Christ. They're scared out their wits about the fact that the abomination of desolation appeared, and they hear the scripture in their mind going, oh my gosh, it said don't have this be when you're pregnant in those days, or be in winter, or be on the Sabbath. <laughs> and they hightail it northward, and then do eastward to get down to Petra, as quick as they can. And many are slaughtered. But God, in his infinite wisdom, protects 12,000 from all 12 tribes and gets them into Petra. So don't believe in no Christ. He said, okay. Remember? And what happens is, to your point, at the end, but to your point, though, at the end of tribulation, then Jesus appears, and they say, where'd you get those wounds? He says, the house of my friends. And then in one day, they're converted. So to your point, at that point, they're in Christ when they are converted at that point. But what I'm saying to you is, that's the whole point. During the time that they are out of the freedom, the, the tribulation period is, is coming to a close. You have the 75-day period of cooling off where Jesus is doing his Valley of Jehoshaphat dealings. You got the Jews taking people out of, about, out of Israel to, out of, to him and Gog, remember? So during this time where all this is going on, prior to that, that's when this infiltration happens. Remember it says when men slept, the enemy sowed. So to your point, it's not afterwards, it's, it's they sowed it beforehand. And they had that seed in there. And once you have that seed of, of, of union between Jew and Gentile, then you, you have this situation involved where you have this, this, un, this not pure line Jew trying to act like I'm a pure line Jew who is part of these people that I have a right of passage to you know, their benefits. Well, that's not the case. So, and that's, that's what you, so your question is a good one. Your statement's a good one. But it's a timeline issue of understanding there was a time that they weren't. And then they were, and how did they become? Well, when Jesus appears before them, when does that happen? That's after the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which we know lasts 75 days. Well, during that time is when this is going on. That's when the enemy showed when men slept. That's when it happened, to your point. So if it happened after that, then it's not, then you're right. They're all in Christ. You can't do that. But it happened before that. And that's what happened. Yes? And he said, okay. And uh, Vicki said, so this is prior to day seven. Okay. Yep. Said, in what verse would I write the 144,000? Well, the 144,000, that's going to go back over into um, the, the parable itself when he says back in verse, uh, let me see here. Uh, let me see. Back in verse 25, when he starts the parable, he said, He sowed Darnell among the wheat, and the wheat. He's talking about there, this is, the other har- this is the other harvest of wheat, the lesser wheat we're talking about of the Jewish people that are in that last wheat harvest that comes off of the end of the earth. So that's, that's the 144,000 that out of them comes those who will inherit the, 30, the 60 fruit yields, you, if you recall, as the wife of God. So out of the wheat on the earth, right, uh, Matthew 13, 25, out of them, there's going to be those who then would then inherit the wife of God position as the 60 fruit people. They're, they're, sh- they're short of the bride, but they're under that. So I hope that makes sense for what you're asking me. So I would write it there, and then you can write it again in other passages where you see uh, when he says, let them both grow together in verse 30. And if you want to be technical over in, in verse 38, the sons of the kingdom, that's a different, um, when he's talking about the, the good seed and he said, that is so good seed in your field. When, when did it grow? So the good seed he's talking about, again, is, is the Jewish people amongst other people that are, that are there continuing to proliferate. And remember, because they're, they're prophet, they remember they're flesh, blood, and bone. They're still sinners. And so they're having continual offspring, continual offspring, 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 offspring. So that's what he's talking about. So when he says the good, he doesn't mean the original 144. He means all the proliferation that comes out of that. So when he says that you sowed good seed, he's talking about you started with 144, right? But now all of a sudden you have this proliferation of not just 144 plus all their good seed coming out, pure Jews. Now you have these 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 hybrid people in here, this, these, these Darnells. What's with that? And he says you can't uproot them both because you can't uproot the Darnell because you'll uproot the Jewish also. It says there's a Jewish line in them. 
Just wait till they come to maturity. I'll take care of it at the end. That's what God's telling them. I got, I got this. Don't worry, don't worry about it. They're trying to inter- intertwine, but I, I'll, I'll separate them. Yes? Mickey said in verse 24, the good grain will be the 144,000. Yes. In verse 24, he shows the good grain. That's, that's correct. That's the 144,000 Jews he's talking about. And the Darnell are the people that he shows, the enemy showed, to come after the good seed, the 144,000, because God's intention was to have the 144,000 come out and then proliferate the earth with pure Jews, like he had from the beginning intended, all throughout the world. So what does Satan do? He already lost the Christian battle thing, right? People in Christ are already procured away from him, but he still has one last ditch effort to go out and, and get these folks. So he comes after him with this issue of being, you know, intermarrying prior to this 75 day period, prior to the official day, day seven start period, which is why he says compared to kingdom of the heavens, because it's the transition parable of what happens right before day seven begins. It's happening right before, literally. 75 days is not that long before. It's like, what is it, just in over two months? Yes. And Todd says, so the 144,000 plus the Greek marrying into the 144,000 are the Darnell? Correct. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying, that's correct. So when I'm saying Greek or Gentile, I, I just, I use that as a, a catch-all for anybody who's not a pure Jew. So if you're not a pure Jew of these 12,000, if you're not part of the 12,000, it's going to be 12 tribes, then you're not, you know, if you're a Jew, right? So at this point, that's all who's alive. There's those 12,000 of 12 tribes, pure Jews, and there's everybody else who's alive. So you're, whoever, whatever they are, they're a mix of all kinds of ethnicities. So I'm just saying Gentile for that, okay? So those people, yes, marry into the, the actual, that when he says, going back to who those people are, they're described as he says, and the enemy came and he showed Darnell. And, and the enemy man means he used a man, by the way. The enemy man, so he used a man. That goes up to verse, so if you go into, um, you go into verse 28, when he says left side of your margin, he said unto them, an enemy man has done this. So it's a man that he, there's these men that he has possessed, influenced. His name is Panero, so I think it's more of an influence, not a possession per se. So he, he actually influenced some of these men, Gentiles, to go in and marry into the Israelites that are pure Jews to proliferate the opportunity to take the kingdom by force. Nothing new under the sun. This happened to Jesus' day too, right? So then what they did is then they, he says now he sowed the Darnell. But how did he do it? He shows later on he did it through being an enemy man. He used a man to sow the Darnell. So the Darnell being sown is the offspring. That's correct. Of the Gentile marrying into the Jewish person. Okay, yes. And Todd said, and this is taking place or set for prior to Jesus reigning on the throne in day seven. This is right prior to that during the 75 day period. So it's right after the Mount of Olives has, this is taking place during the, there are, there, the Petra, they've been released from Petra because the Armageddon has, the Gog and Magog too has been, has been ended. It's already happened. He's, he's in the Valley of Jehoshaphat doing his deal, and they're taking out the carcasses of the Hemingog from the Gog and Magog battle. So they're not in Petra anymore. They're now, in, they're now out of Petra. They're in Jerusalem. They're in Israel, taking the dead carcasses out to Hemingog. Remember? They're taking out the dead carcasses out of he- to Hemingog because they're already, they're, they, they, they were in Petra. Hey, look, I'll put it on the board. Here's a timeline. So the 144,000 people. They're in Petra. Then Gog and Magog, number two battle happens. That happens, right? That happens right here. Whoops. Ah. Come on. <coughs> that happens. Then, then they go to they go to the land of Israel again. They go to the land of Israel to take out, take out the garbage, basically. God says, get those carcasses out of here. Put them in Hemingog. Remember that in Ezekiel? He says, get them out of here. Well, who's doing that? They are. They're doing that. They're in Petra. Gog and Magog happens. 
he lets them go here, while then Jesus, while they're doing that, Jesus is doing his thing in Jehoshaphat. You know, he's doing, he's doing the, the Mount of Olives thing, where it splits in two. Okay, so this right here is the Armageddon, is all of this. Armageddon is all of this. But it's in three phases. Gog and Magog, then the land of Israel, they're taking, this, they're taking the carcasses out to Hem and Gog. If you remember, of the dead bodies. And while they're doing this, while they're doing this, Jesus is taking everybody else who never believed in him. He's, he's bringing a reckoning, doesn't he? Right? And that's going on for 75 days. This whole period here is going on for 75 days, according to Daniel. And during this time, everybody else on the earth, they're not assigned to do anything. They're just waiting for this to be done and this to be done. <coughs> so during that 75 days, some Gentile folks come into here, and they have some offspring that later on rear their ugly face over here as Darnell, which is why you don't see them appear until later, because it's called the gestation cycle of pregnancy. Remember, 75 days is only two and a half months. You can't get pregnant and have birth in two and a half months. That's like nearly impossible. I guess it's happened, but I think it's nearly impossible. I'm not a doctor. I don't think that's possible, but I don't know. I'm not, I don't know how preemie someone could be, but that's kind of insane. Okay. Yes. I said gotta. So that, that's what's going on. So great question. It's, it involves a lot of detail of timeline and flow, but when you see it, you go, okay. So then you have the question of, the latter part of the question is, you said, you said in verse uh, 40, as therefore the Darnell is gathered and burned in a fire, so will it be in the end of the age. The son of, the son of man will send forth his messengers and will gather out of his kingdom all seducers, which is the word scandalon, people who cause stumbling block of enticing to others, and it says iniquitous persons, which is all actually anomia, which is transgressing people that are rebellious people, out of his kingdom. That's during day seven. You go, well, yeah. Then he says, and he will throw them into the furnace of fire. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then, then, then will the righteous and the splendid of the son and the, and the, and the kingdom and the father, he who hears, let him hear. So all you got to do there Go over to Revelation, you say, I thought only Satan and his angels go to the lake of fire, and they'll take the mark of the beast. These folks didn't take the mark of the beast. This is at the end of day seven. So what's with that? Well, glad you asked. Go to Revelation chapter two. Don't forget. Just, these are just little tweaks you have to remember. It's, there's so much stuff that we, we studied. It's easy to forget stuff or overlook stuff or just you know not remember it. I get it. I get it. We're all, I, I do it too. So in, in Revelation chapter 2, in verse 11, let him who has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. The conqueror or overcomer shall not be injured by the second death. <laughs> okay, let's go to Revelation in chapter 21. Or actually, first of all, context. Revelation 20, and that verse 10, and that enemy who deceived them from that was cast into the lake of the fire and sulfur where both the beast and the false prophet were cast and they were tormented day and night for ages of ages. That's Revelation 20, verse 10. Then you turn the page of your Dagalot, Revelation 21, verse 8. But as, but as for the cowards, the unbelievers, the abominable, and the murderers, and the fornicators, and the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and all the liars, their portion, their miros, their part, will be in that lake which burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Because second death, you're forgetting, is this. It's only permanently the place for those of Satan, false prophet, and the beast, or I should say the false prophet, as you say, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and, and, and Satan, Antichrist, false prophet, and, and Satan, they are thrown into like a fire, Satan himself into the abyss. Those take the mark of the beast were also with him for the ages of ages. I say forever, the ages of ages. But you're forgetting about the portion. There's many of people that are not going to be there for duration 
of ages of ages, but they will be there for an age, for day eight. Why? He tells you in Matthew 13 why, because they were scandalin and they were anomia. They were causing enticing stumbling blocks to others, and they were transgressing and rebelling. Or they fit the list in Revelation 21.8 of being idiots, cowards, abominable, and so forth. And they had their portion, their miros, in the lake of fire. Because they didn't overcome. You have to overcome. You have to, in day seven, have the fruit yield, commensurate to what is expected of you, to go into day eight without any harm said unto you. And if you do not, you'll have a portion where your sin is purged from you for the lake of fire, which is for straight up disobedience. Because at that point, Hades, Gehenna are done. Day eight begins, as we know. There's no more Hades, there's no more Gehenna. It's over. It's now no more a place for reconciliation. There's no more a place for sanctification. At this point, God's saying, we went through a thousand years of that. If you don't get what that is by now, you got issues. You're just flat out, straight up, hardcore, stubborn, disobedient. And I got a place for that. It's called Lake of Fire. I'm not playing with you. So if you want to be an idiot and be a scandal in, you want to be enticed to somebody block somebody else, you want to entice somebody else to sin against me, you want to go and be a rebellious person against what, who I am, what I say, oh, do you now? Do you think this is funny? Fine. Lake of Fire for you, son, daughter. I love you, but I can't tolerate that kind of behavior. And I'm not going to. So I'm going to purge it off of you till it burns your, your backside, okay? So how about that? And they have their portion, but then God does take them out at the end of day eight. It's not forever, just for a time. Yes? And talk to these people, unbelievers, have the blood of the Paschal Lamb. Okay, so when you're looking at, yes, because remember, he's talking about. The, the, the portion refers to the age. He's talking about, that's correct, the portion refers to day eight. When he says for cowards and unbelievers, the phrasing there for the unbelievers, it's the apistos, which is, apistos uh, is the word faith, and a means no faith. So they're faithless, which has the idea of, if you go back and read the paper I wrote on salvation of the soul, and we mentioned this before, Christendom says unbelievers always mean people that don't believe in Jesus. Scripture uses the word unbeliever to speak to somebody who don't ongoingly believe. This goes back to the misnomer of John 3.16. For God so loved the world, the cosmos, the people of covenant, that he gave his only begotten, preeminent, only dominant manifestation of God in the flesh, God the Son, so that whosoever, whosoever, meaning doesn't matter the ethnicity, the culture, the gender, God's going to choose out many different folk of different peoples. Not they choose him, he chooses them. Whosoever be <laughs> believeth upon him, and the phrase in there is, is believing ongoing. Say what? Yeah. Whoever, whosoever believing ongoingly on him has life for the age. Not eternal life, that's a bogus, has life for the age. How can you have life for the age if you believe one time and go, uh, I'm good. Uh, I'm tapped out. What? There's no way you're going to get life for the age. You just sit there and, you know, chill. Ain't going to happen. That's why in John 3, 16, the word in the Greek is an ongoing belief. Because if you don't do that, then you're an unbelieving believer. You believe, but you don't ongoingly believe. That's why in Hebrews 10, he says, we are not like them who shrink back unto destruction, but we are those who persevere unto faith. You have to continue in your faith. That's why James talks about that, that the faith that you have initially is one thing. But that faith by itself will not save you from destruction, from hardship, from disobedience, from consequences. You have to move on in your faith if you want to be saved from any negative reality of consequence. Accountability, right? So the unbelieving, yes. Are people covered by the blood of Christ? Yes. There are folks who believe in Jesus, Yeshua, as their God, their Savior, their Redeemer of their souls. But yes, they are going to go to the lake of fire. Why? Because God hates them? No! Because God's going, suck up! No! Because as a loving father, he's brokenhearted for his children who just don't get it. And he's given them time 
and time and time and time again to come to peace with him, to come to know his love. He has continuously, relentlessly hounded them with his love and forgiveness. And they say, no, no, no. And he goes, you know what? There's only so much of your attitude I'm going to be able to want to show the rest of these people that I do love and I do forgive and I have long suffering. But your attitude and your, and your actions are intolerable. And I will bring justice to them. I have to. I'm a holy God. I love you. But I cannot let you take everything I have given in myself as a sacrifice and make it treated like that. Because you represent me. And when you act like that, you're acting like a horse's patoot. And I gave everything I had, my life, my very being, I used to make you. I came down here to actually be here for you. And you take it like that? I love you too much. You've got to learn your lesson. You've got to stop. It's got to stop. And they won't listen. And so finally, he says, like any good parent's going to do, at some point, you only love a child so much where you go, enough. Enough is enough. Personally, I think 6,000 years plus another 1,000 years of him reigning physically, 7,000 total, is a pretty good length of time to say God's been very long-suffering. Now, granted, he had, he had to throw in there a little flood. You know, he did that in the past, too. So he already did the reset button once. But, you know, hey, the reality is this is only for a portion of time. This is not a permanent thing. It's only for a portion of time. But that's why he does it. If he loves them too much, let them continue to move on like this. And he's not going to let it go by without being unchecked, unchallenged. He's going to correct it. He's just going to. It's accountability. So hope that answers your question. I hope that answers the du du duality of your question about what day are we in and what's the furnace of fire mean and who are these people with the Darnell. Did I answer your question satisfactory? I don't know. you got to tell me. I don't he know. He said they are being judged at the great throne. Yes, because these are people that are in Christ that are on the earth that are, remember, the great white thrones are folks that are on the earth or under the earth. It's for nobody in the heavens. That's not for them. So the great white thrones are folks on the earth or under the earth. And so these people are the ones who have sin and death in them. So if you're wondering, how can they be these ways if they were in Christ and sin was taken out of them? <laughs> Well, you're right. That's not those people. There's people on the earth like that. You're right. That are sinless on the earth. There are people like that in Christ. But there's other folks, earthy ones, remember, that do have sin and death in them. They did not inherit. They entered. Those people are the ones. And the others who went in with no sin but then took part in sin, those two groups of people that have the possibility of fitting Revelation 20, verse 8. There's those that went in with sin, and it got the better of them, survivors from tribulation. Or there's those, and there's, there's also these earthy ones, people, that that's what they their just do is. They didn't have enough fruit yield, right? Well, there's those that do have the earthy one status of no sin in them, but they give in to sin, and they become back in that fallen state again. So there's those with sin and those who come into sin that are the groups of people, those two groups, that comprise those who are the possible ones who fit this narrative of Revelation 20, verse 8. That's where they come from. And that goes back to 1 Corinthians 15, the different bodies and how they're raised and who's where and how. Yes? Todd said, that's what I thought. Really good answering the question. Thank you. Cool. All right. So <clears throat> then you asked me about the firmament and to draw a picture of it. So there's this picture. So if you want to you zoom in on that, babe, zoom in for a little bit so you can see that. So Todd sent me this in an email. Just a minute. He sent this in an email, and this, and this is a picture of what you'll see online of the old Hebraic view of their interpretation of putting in a visual uh, Genesis. So the old Hebraic view that they had of Genesis was depicted like this. I'm holding in my hand. The difference is in this picture, you have the sun, moon, and stars right in here, which is completely wrong. 
and you say, what makes you right and them wrong? Uh, who, who, who you'd say? I, I'm nobody, I'm a doofus. But here's what I'll tell you. Hold it up a little bit. Not, not, not that high. But here's what I'll tell you. Who am I to say differently is because of this. They saw things differently because of where they were and how God did, did or did not open up their minds to things that we know now in the New Testament. So no matter how smart and how diligent they were, and there's nothing taken away from those men and women, God love them, they mean very well. They're only limited by the, what God did not expose them to. They did not know God the Son in Christ, did they? No. They did not know him. They knew of him in some vague way in prophecies, but they don't know him anywhere near like we know him. The breadth, the, breadth, the length, the height, the depth of the word of God has been given to us to have an opportunity to dig that out. They have no idea about that. So to their defense, they're limited in what they know. But what they do know, there's those who did a very good job of being astute to put things together. And what they don't know, they don't know, and they're limited, so they put things where they thought they would go. And the one mistake they made is they saw one firmament. There's two firmaments, not one. There's two, not one. So they put one firmament right here. That's wrong. Does a firm, they put a firmament of the sky and firmament here. No, 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 no. This firmament here of the sky, this firmament here of the heavens. So they said this is the firmament. No, no, no. The, the, the firmament is above the waters. Here. They put it with the waters. That's wrong. And this firmament out here is where the sun, moon, and stars are right out here. So that's where they messed up. They see a separation, as you can see. They show the word firmament and the firmament. It's actually reversed. This is firmament, and this is the firmament. But you have the firmament of, of the actual earth and the firmament of the heavens. So I hope that makes sense in what I'm saying to you. But So this chart that you see, I'll, I'll put it down now, was interesting that I have seen that before. And so I just want to make sure you understood there's a difference between, so there's, I want to make sure it makes sense again. So there's, so there's, I'll put this in a, so there's a firmament. There's a firmament, which we call, like, we should call, this is called the universe. We're going to call that the universe, okay? That's the universe, all right? Then within, within a firmament, you have the firmament. of the heavens and you have the firmament of the earth so you have two different firmaments and so when you have this one here this is where this is your sky and this right here is where you have your so when you go over to Genesis for example when you go to Genesis in chapter 1, <coughs> and he says, and he said in verse 14, and God let there be light and the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be signs for seasons, for days, for years. Let them be lights and the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And so it was, and God made two great lights. And so, and God gave them, verse 17, and the firmament of the heavens. So this is of the heavens. So you have firmament of the heavens where you have the sun and moon. And you had, of course, water here. Separating these two firmaments. All right? So I hope that makes sense. And then here is where the birds are. Then, of course, you have land down here. All right? So that's the difference, okay? So I don't want you to get mistaken on the chart. They didn't understand the difference between a firmament, which is the entire universe itself. Then you have the firmament of the heavens, water. Then you have the firmament of the earth. Then you have the land, which is with water as well. And that's what you have a difference there. So I hope that makes sense. That chart, I hope you can see under the drawing I, I did there. You can see there's a difference there and how that all plays out, but I hope that makes sense. Yes? 
He said thanks. Yep. So there's just a it's just a tweak, and the and the problem is interesting enough. And and if you probably haven't already known this, there are people that actually believe that the the sun, moon, and stars are in our firmament in the sky. I'm not joking. They actually believe. I met one of them, a live human being, not a dead person, a live person, not a person who wrote a book, a live human being, alive today, who works at Lockheed Martin, uh, an engineer <laughs> guy. He actually thinks that the sun, moon, and stars are in our firmament of the sky. I'm like, excuse me? That's insane. But he's, I'm like, I don't know how the heck you can think that. You, if the sun was that close, you'd be scorched. You'd be dead. I mean, it's just insane. The moon was that close, you'd have tons of floods. It's just insane. Anyways, yeah, no, sorry. Vicki said, where is God's throne in this? The universe? Okay, so, nope, he's outside. So remember, when God first made it, he was outside. Then he went, then he goes inside. Then Satan made it go darkness. He goes, I'm outside again. And then when he got to be, and then, he, then he, every now and then he would go back inside of time. He'd walk with, he'd walk with Abram, for example, right? He'd walk with Adam, or the first man, I should say, the man in Adam. When he came back as, I mean, as Jesus, whoa, now he's permanently in time again. So, so God was in here. He was outside. Then he made this, and he went inside. Then Satan did, he did, and God went outside. Then God would restored it, then came back inside again with ha Adam, And then he sinned, and God said, I'm out again. I won't strive with man. Remember, he said that. So I'm out. And then he comes back from time to time and visits people like Noah and Abram and Moses and so forth. But then he comes back at Jesus like, I'm here now permanently. I'm never leaving again, which I think is awesome. Now, he left physically, but he hasn't left in his spirit. That's what Jesus said, that his spirit was given as our paraclete, our comforter. He'll never leave us. He said that. I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. That's, he meant that literally. He'll never leave again. He'll never leave again. He would come and go constantly, but not anymore. He, he's staying forever now. That's, that's awesome. It's awesome. He's outside of time in his throne, but he himself will never leave here again, and eventually he's going to have his, his spirit will always be here, and he's going to have his throne at one time, sit foot, which is New Jerusalem. That's why it's a big deal to sit on the earth in day eight. It's a huge deal. It's huge. I mean, literally, it's huge as Trump would say. So, all right, that answers your question, I hope. And I'll be more clear on this. I know it's not as good drawing there, but. She said yes. I'll be clearer about that in the in other lessons we're going to do on Sunday as well. All right, well, let's close in prayer. There's any other questions we have. Any other questions? Any other clarity I need? Todd, I answered your question. It seems like satisfactorily, so if there's any other things I need. Todd said, wait. Okay. What you got? He said, Pam is typing. Oh, okay, sure. Wait. said, so in Genesis 6, 7, the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, man and animals and creatures that move along the ground and uh, yeah. birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. Yes. Are the the made man included in this or just the made animals and the created man? Interesting. Yeah, so interesting you say this. Um, yeah, because that's an interesting point you just made there. 
because the word he says here when he says in verse 7, and he will destroy man. He said, okay, right? Yeah, who, 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 yes. so he's going to destroy the man he created, which is going to, and we know for a fact, he, this was the, he did, in fact, just these angels went into a punishment at this time. We know this. And so there is the judgments of the angels that we know about, and this was one of them. It's because they had the relations with the women and the hybrid offspring, and he was not happy with them. So they were supposed to set guard for mankind in Eden as those types of those metaphors of those trees, and instead they took advantage of mankind. And so you can see how God should, it's almost like a policeman who exploits people. Your job is to serve and protect. And when you take your authority and you abuse it, that's, that goes beyond the pale. It's one thing to break the law, but if you're the law enforcer and you're breaking the law, it's even more grievous. Because now you're, it's, they trusted you. They entrusted you and you've exploited it. And that's what God is saying here. He's destroying, he's talking about you're correct. The angelic people that have betrayed their first estate, as Jude calls it. And it's not good. They went after strange flesh. He did it here and did it again later on, as we saw in Sodom and Gomorrah as well. So, so they went after strange flesh. So you, they, they, wanted these, they wanted the men in the house, remember? So the reality here is yes. So what you're asking the question is, um, he says he like, he's, he's going to destroy the man he created from the face of the earth. He said both man and beast. So he t he's talking about all three things. So basically everything that God is everything. Everything that God did in Genesis chapter 1, the created man, the made man, the other things he, he has made there, um, he's destroying it all, obviously, except for what he put on the ark. The seven and seven of the clean, the two and the, the pairs of the unclean, and then Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And that was it. So, but all the other made men, humankind, was eliminated. And all the created man, the angelic hosts, they were also slaughtered as well. Because they were on the earth. Let's face that. People don't, you forget that. But if you go back to Ezekiel 31, every time that it seems like it's a little bit weird, just do yourself a favor. Whenever you start feeling like, boy, I don't know if I want to believe that anymore. It sounds kind of weird. Go back to Ezekiel 31 and read it. Go back to Ezekiel 28 and read it. And as soon as you read Ezekiel 28 again, Ezekiel 31 again, you'll be like, oh, yeah. Because God makes it so crystal abundantly clear that he's using trees as metaphors to represent Satan and other angelic hosts in the Garden of Eden is extremely obvious to anybody who's reading that with just seeing God's will and being said to you. So you'll see that for what it is. But yeah, to answer your question, that's, that's what that is. And he's, he's sighing because he came. He, uh, he already was, he, he was outside, right? Made it, lived inside. Satan ruined it. He goes outside. He restores it, comes back inside. For what? For man to ruin it again idiot. So yeah, it's frustrating. How much more frustrating can he's already he's already done this twice now. He made it, got ruined, restored it, it got ruined. He's like, you know, uh, that's frustrating. Imagine you, you know, us doing that. And you build something and someone ruins it, then you restore it, they ruin it again. You're not going to be happy about that, right? Especially when you keep giving a lot of latitude to get it right. To understand, would you just appreciate what I've done, what I've given you here? To keep on ruining it. Yes. So Mom said, so once they had uh, relations with those women, they were bound to the earth and earthly yeah. and earthly bodies that were literally slaughtered. Yeah, yeah. Um, remember, they had flesh. I'm not saying earthly bodies; they had flesh, and that's the those are the ones you see them. Um, they're they're it's mentioned in they're mentioned in Jude as having flesh. Those are the angels in Jude. The ones mentioned in Genesis 6, 7, you can align with the, the net of what he's talking about. He's specific to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he says, likened unto them, angels left their first estate, went after strange flesh. That's who he's talking about, is the ones you just, you just mentioned, Genesis 6, 7. And so no, we know, one, they had flesh, and we know, two, God brought them under judgment. So yes, in their flesh, they felt some type of pain and some type of destruction. How that works, I don't know. I don't want to say it's the same type of thing that we have because they're not us. They're, they're different than us. They're angelic hosts that have flesh. I don't know what that, they're spirits with flesh. I don't know how that works, but it, they definitely could feel pain. They could feel the fact that they had relations with a woman to pro proliferate this hybrid giants in the land. So how that works out, I don't know. But it's, it's uh, rather just saddening to God to see his creation 
in his, what he created and made. And that's, by the way, for folks, for folks who actually don't want to get, so if you don't want to really, the really key verse that really helps people to see the difference in those two words is Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. And God Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God Elohim created and made. So for those who want to dis- d- debate me and say, oh, then you could just parse out those words. Then why did God say it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3? Created and made. Why, why, did, why did God do that? Is he stuttering? Is he repeating himself? Or is it the third answer, which is those two different things? And if so, go back and figure out what that is and figure out the question why. And we know why, because created means something different than made. Who it, who it represents. Yes? Then said maybe their flesh was transformed and Adam and Eve after they sinned. Or like that, Adam and Eve. Yes, I, I happen to believe that myself. I believe that myself, that in some way it was changed to, to be bound to your point to this earth. I just don't know in what way. Because I can only imagine if, if, if Adam and Eve were in the, the kind of glory of God and they weren't naked in that way, but then they were, they were taken from them and they saw themselves as naked, how much more would these spiritual angelic beings be clothed and how much greater would their fall be? You know, it, it's wow, to your point, I, I get it. It's, I get the concept, but I don't know what it looks like in reality. Yes? Craig and Sandy had to sign off. They said, uh, thank you so much, Pastor. We have to sign off now. Have a nice evening, yeah. everyone. Yep, that's okay. So it's uh, we'll, we'll close in prayer. I think we're. That, I think are we? Is that answer your? Are we good? So, let's let's close in prayer. So we get a little bit later. So, let's. She said, "Oh yes." Yeah. Okay. okay let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for this time and day we've had together with you. Thank you for your study, for your insight into your word, into who you are, into understanding and being better as your children, as your servants. Be with us, bless us, continue to show us and enlighten us to your truth, to your word, to your, to your love and forgiveness and restoration. Thank you for your long suffering and for your, your desire to want to be with us and strive with us and to continue to uh, be long suffering and restoring us back to faith, back to belief and being thankful and grateful for you as our Father. Thank you for loving us, Father, once again. Be with us throughout the weekend, bring us back together safely, and we thank you for everything you do and have done and are continuing to do in our lives. In Jesus' Yeshua's name, amen.